Hi there. My name is Aaron Lanterman. I'm a professor of electrical and computer engineering at Georgia Tech. And in the past week of guitar amplification and effects, we've been looking at common cathode amplifiers. This week, we're going to start looking at common plate amplifiers, also known as cathode followers. So one way to build a common plate amplifier would be to just build a common cathode amplifier and take the output from the cathode instead of the plate. If we were to build such a thing, we could expand it out as thus. This looks like the DC circuit and the small signal quote unquote AC circuit for a common cathode amplifier, except we're taking the output from the cathode instead of from the plate. Now, this is what I showed you in that initial lecture where I said, here's three kinds of amplifiers we're gonna look at, and I presented it this way in order to emphasize the common aspects of the various amplifier structures. This particular bias scheme isn't really practical for building a good cathode follower, and I'll explain why a little bit later. For now, I'm just going to stick with analyzing the small signal circuit, and in the next few lectures, we'll look at variations of this bias scheme that are more practical. But for now, we're just going to focus on small signal aspects. So here I have my small signal model with a load resistance going to this AC ground. We have an input coming in through the grid, and we're looking at the output through the cathode. In the future, we'll look at variations of this where this cathode resistance is split over two resistors, and you can actually take the output from either one depending on what you're doing. I should also mention that this load resistance is generally omitted, so RL equals zero if you're just building a cathode follower, although it's left in if you're building another kind of structure where you take the output from the, both the cathode and the plate. That's a particular kind of structure called a cathodyne that's used for phase inversion, which is something we'll look at later in the class. So you can take our triode here and replace it with the small signal model consisting of a voltage controlled voltage source. Here we have the input and the output. The output here is the same as the cathode to ground voltage. So this is really just Vn minus V out. And part of that triode model includes this dynamic plate resistance, little rp. Again, that's a dynamic quantity that changes with the bias current, and it's not representing something like the resistance of the actual leads going into the plate or something like that. It's part of our small signal model. All right, so you can use Kirchhoff's voltage law and analyze this circuit using your standard circuit techniques. And when I first taught this class in the spring of 2017, I did exactly that, and it took a while. But we've developed some Thevenin equivalent circuits that will make this analysis easier following the techniques of Marshall Leach. So let's use a Thevenin equivalent looking up into the positive terminal of the voltage controlled voltage source. Remember for the common cathode, we use the other equivalent looking down into the negative terminal. So as a review, if you look at that previous lecture where we developed some Thevenin equivalents, we saw that this particular structure here, where everything on the other side of the voltage controlled voltage source, I'm lumping into something I'm calling R top. We can replace that with a voltage that I'm calling VGG here to be generic, times mu over mu plus one. So if mu is big, this is pretty close to one. But we also have a Thevenin resistance in series with this Thevenin voltage. That's this R top divided by mu plus one. So remember, in the other Thevenin equivalent, looking down into the negative terminal, we took the resistance on the other side and multiplied it by mu plus 1. But here, we divide by mu plus 1. So I think that's a really interesting symmetry, and it has some consequences for the circuit and why it makes such a good voltage buffer. So in this particular case, VGG just corresponds to our VN. And the RL in series with RP, so that's RL plus RP, that corresponds to our R top. So replacing the circuitry up there with our Thevenin equivalent, we have our Thevenin voltage seen at the output through a resistor divider. And we can then actually write down what the equations for that are. And we can see that our output is going to equal our Thevenin voltage times the effect of the voltage divider. So we're dividing this voltage here across this resistance RK.
And notice that if I can find a tube with a better mu, that improves my voltage buffer in two ways. One is bigger mu gives me a factor here that's closer to one. Also, as mu increases, the entire term here decreases, and that means I'm getting something closer to just RK over RK. Similarly, I could try to get a better voltage follower by just making RK really big so it swamps this term here, although there's practical limits concerning biasing as far as how big I can make RK. My small signal gain A is just Vn over V out. Now, this expression is a little bit cumbersome, so let's do some algebra on it. Let me just rewrite it up here. I can take this mu plus one factor and multiply it through. Then I wind up with mu plus one times RK plus RL plus RP in the denominator. And the way you'll usually see this written in textbooks, or actually I haven't looked in a textbook about this in a while, the way I like to write it is to actually put the RK with the mu plus one near the end of the expression. That's just a stylistic choice. Now this is a cleaner looking expression and it's one that we'll typically use, but this expression has value because it identifies the two components that make up the gain. There's the raw gain from the tube itself, and there's the loss through that voltage divider. It's instructive to compare this formula for the gain for our common drain amplifier with the formula we previously computed for the common cathode amplifier. When presented in this form, there's two main differences. One, obviously, this has a minus sign in front because the common cathode stage is inverting. But the only other real main difference is that we have RK in the numerator for the common drain amp and RL in the numerator for the common cathode amp. But the denominators are, in fact, the same. So one way of viewing this is that one amp is kind of a vaguely flipped version of the other, although I would not want to push that analogy too far. These aren't really symmetric structures. If there was a real underlying symmetry, then you would flip the RK and the RL here, but you don't. They're in the same spot, so these aren't really symmetric. I just found that little bit of commonality interesting. Anyway, let's explore this gain expression in this form a little bit more. If I were to take this expression and ask what happens as mu goes to infinity, as mu gets big, well, eventually the constant terms here, I should say the terms that are constant with respect to mu, wind up being swamped by the terms that contain mu. So this starts to look a little something like this. You could imagine canceling out the RKs. And so this starts to look like just mu over mu plus one. And as mu gets bigger and bigger and bigger, this gets close to one. That isn't terribly surprising. It matches the analysis we did on the more primitive form of this expression that we looked at earlier when we were first starting to derive it. Now, let's take that same expression and play another game. If I were to, say, let the cathode resistance get bigger, well, eventually, again, the terms here that are constant, in this case with respect to RK, wind up getting swamped by these terms with RK in them, and I wind up with something that looks like mu over mu plus one when the RKs wind up getting canceled out. So if we were to allow ourselves to use a really, really big cathode resistor, then the only limit on performance would be the gain of the tube. But of course, we don't have tubes with infinite amplification factors. And as I mentioned earlier, as far as biasing goes, you can't really make RK be too big. So that was all about the small signal gain. Let's talk about the output impedance. So to compute the output impedance, I need to zero out this voltage source. So I have two resistances in parallel looking into V out. I'm leaving this symbol here, this little green set of arrows that are facing upward to indicate where that original Thevenin equivalent was, but we're now looking at the resistance looking into V out. So now I just have RK in parallel with this RL plus RP over mu plus one, and notice how easy that was to do once we had established that Thevenin equivalent. If you try to do that calculation directly from this circuit, you have to zero out this independent voltage source, 
and then put a test source here and then compute the test voltage over the test current in order to get the Thevenin resistance. And it takes you a while. But using the Thevenin equivalent, the answer just pops right out. Now, notice that if you increase mu, you wind up decreasing this resistance. So that starts to dominate the parallel combination. It doesn't really matter what RK is. So as you improve mu, you improve your output impedance. And it's this very low output impedance that makes this such a good voltage buffer. It's instructive to compare this with the output impedance of the common cathode amplifier, where you multiply by mu plus one instead of dividing by mu plus one. So for the common cathode, the limiting factor as mu increases is this load resistance RL. And notice as mu increases for your common cathode stage, the output impedance actually gets worse. So as our first example of a cathode follower, let's try repurposing that first preamp stage of the Mesabogi dual rectifier. I want to use this example because we've looked at this circuit a lot and we analyzed its bias points and its small signal properties when being used in its proper way as a common cathode amplifier in several lectures. So we've seen a lot of it. Now, I can't really complain that the circuit doesn't make a good cathode follower because it's not designed to be a good cathode follower. It's designed to be a good preamp stage where you take your output up here. But let's just see what happens if you take your output down here. Let's assume that this 1.8K resistor is completely unbypassed. In the original circuit, this was either completely bypassed or partially bypassed that would bring the resistance down to something like 1.7K. Let's just assume it's 1.8K. So if we take the bias points that we computed in a previous lecture and plug them into the formula here, we wind up with 100 over 101. Well, that's really just from the mu on the data sheet. RK is 1.8K, RL is 220K, and the main thing we need from a previous lecture is the 72K plate resistance. I was too lazy to put in all of the kilo-ohm notations. They wind up canceling out anyway. So notice I used this raw form of the expression we originally computed instead of the more refined form where this mu plus one is multiplied through because it nicely shows us the effect of the different factors. So here we have mu over mu plus one, this 0 0.99, that's just what you get from the triode. And here we can see why this makes such a bad cathode follower. It's this term right here relative to the size of RK. So if I actually compute what this is, I get 0.99 times 0.3838. So this is a pretty small number. And it's because this term here is so big relative to this term. So what you really want to do is you really would like to have a bigger cathode resistance here so that these numbers here are bigger and can swap out this number here. The problem is if you try to increase this cathode resistance using this particular bias scheme, then the bias current starts getting dropped pretty low and you wind up with something closer to that cold clipper kind of configuration we looked at previously. And that's not what we want here. So in the next few lectures, we'll be looking at different alternative bias schemes that are more practical.